Well yes. put, Gabrielle. But are dreams supposed to come true? Are they ambitions that we strive to make real? Or are they simply things that are meant to be unattainable, existing to help us get through the mundanity of our everyday life? This seems to be the question at the centre of Pearl Clegg's Blues for an Alabama Sky. Though the play's reliance on archetypes and its predictable story arc and outcome means this is a play to entertain you rather than enlighten you. Any further than Gabrielle already has, of course. This production at the National Theatre's Littleton is billed as a startling revival of an extraordinary play. As far as I can find, it is perhaps its first UK staging at all, professionally. There was another revival in America earlier this year that received fair to mixed reviews. As with the original 1995 production, this was off-Broadway. Be forgiven if you haven't heard of it. It seems the aforementioned extraordinariness hasn't been that far reaching. Greeted by an impressive looking tenement building that has been built on a little done stage by designer Frankie Bradshaw, the story centres around four friends in 1930s Harlem, a time when the Great Depression had taken uh, the shine off the promise of the city that drew so many people there. These four have the sort of friendship you only see on stage rarely in real life. It's built from the need to give a play its narrative rather than from any commonality in their lives. <clears throat> each of these characters has their own individual dream. Each deals with their dream and its outcomes differently. Though of course the story arcs do occasionally overlap, each of these stories could exist as fully formed individual plays. And therein lies the problem of tempting tidbits of things to come. Uh, this is a play for those who prefer a stand-up buffet to a full sit-down meal. This isn't necessarily a problem, but it promises to deliver so much we feel we're only snacking. The central characters are club singer Angel, The Handmaid's Tales, Samira Wiley, making her UK professional theatre debut here, and dressmaker Guy, played by Hamilton's Giles Torreira. Angel is one of life's victims, trapped in a revolving search for a better life she will never achieve. She dreams of independence, whilst unaware of her reliance on men to get that independence. From her earlier life as a prostitute, just to get money to leave, to her current role, the gang mistress, to further her singing career. Even her accommodation here is at the purse of Big Daddy Guy. It leads us to Guy. Guy is camp in the way that people on stage are camp. It is theatrically camp. He embraces his difference as a character in a world where different means wrong. We hear of all male decadent parties in dangerous all male streets where a guy runs into trouble at least once. But both these interesting worlds are only given passing reference. Inside the tenement, everything is focused on Josephine Baker, a portrait of whom hangs on the back wall. The others mock him as he makes dresses, sends them to her in Paris, and waits for his a literal ticket out of there in a telegram she may never send. I tell you the outcome of this, this dream, but it is rather surprising. Torreira has a lot of fun with the part. He gives a masterclass in eyebrow arching, lip pursing and pinky waving. Like John Inman never died. You shall go to the ball. This is a sort of uber defiant gay character that we saw a lot in so-called AIDS plays of the 80s and 90s. It's a little tiresome. It's a gay man, as written by a straight woman. It's a cliched fag with Angel playing the requisite hag. It's an enjoyable performance because you recognise it from previous performances of similar roles. That doesn't mean it's real. In 2022, that's a bit of a shame. Living just across the hall on her own is young, naive Delia. Bit of Ronke Akadekaluelu. The character is played really well, but it's a jumble of contradictions that I can't quite get my head around. 
She is meant to be naive and young and, and gentle. She's not a fan of partying. However, she idolises Angel as though she's a sister. Why would an introverted and shy person like this be fighting to open a birth control centre in Harlem, which is her dream? A, a birth control centre at the time is a huge deal. Delia faces opposition, eventually physically. But, like with the homophobic incidents and the parties mentioned by Guy earlier, this part of the story happens off stage. She seems to have been drawn to be an opposite to Angel rather than being fully thought through. But bridging the gap between these two flats of partygoers and non partygoers is Dr. Sam, the Sule Rimi. Sam is a party hard, work hard type of guy. Working double shifts at the hospital, he helps deliver endless Harlem babies. He also privately terminates many unwanted Harlem babies or he's drinking moonshine and dancing at the local duke joints with Angel and Guy. Delia and Sam fall in love, in case you haven't seen that coming, we do. It is likely based on their availability as characters to do so. Into this group comes Alabama-born Leland, played by Ozzy Ickley. We initially see Guy being helped by Leland uh, at the opening of the play as he's trying to get a drunken angel home. Very soon he returns to court her affections in a very gentlemanly manner. He is Alabama through and through. As though learning a lesson from how to develop the structure of a play, he's more catalyst than character. He's, he's poorly written. He is anti-homosexual. He is anti-birth control. He's anti-women's rights. He doesn't drink or dancing. He is anti-fun. He stands for against everything that the other four characters stand for. So, of course, Angel considers uh, being with him. She reminds him of his dead wife. He gives her a pinafore dress that doesn't match any of her normal sexy outfits. Oh, and he gives her his mother's wedding ring that also belonged to his dead wife. They have sex, they dance, he proposes, yada, 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 yada. Oh, and he carries a gun. You don't need to be an expert in Ibsen to know how this will turn out. And it does, with very predictable melodrama. Blues has the makings of this play. In fact, it has the makings of four. It would be far richer if it just focused on one of the character's stories. As it is, we're teased uh, with various elements of things that happen off stage. Without the steps to characters, we don't really care. That doesn't mean it isn't enjoyable. You will like them, even if you don't believe them. There's a, a lack of empathy, which means there's an interaction in the audience rather than an investment by them. What do I mean by that? Uh, as the play progresses, dramatic moments receive whoops and cheers. The gun reveal gets an oh no! Narrow-minded views that should make you think are treated as comedy. So when Leland says, I'm your man, showing his ownership of uh, Angel, it's greeted with a huge laugh. It's really odd to be surrounded by this sort of reaction in this sort of play. Generally, people don't whoop and holler if they feel transported to the play's time and place. I wonder if Clegg may be surprised to hear this sort of interaction. If Clegg might think the message she is telling is more worthy, but just people are enjoying the fun night out. It's just poorly written. There could be merit in doing a, a revival of the current marketing material. We have very National Theatre-esque posts at the moment, serious, evocative, black and white headshots. Why not replace these with, with a photo of the cast drinking champagne and, and trying to do the Charlton? In fact, why not go further? Change the name, call it Whoops! There Goes Alabama! Watch ticket sales soar. <laughs> <laughs>